So welcome everybody to the environmental history of Japan panel. So this is one of the last panel session of history section at the EAJS and thank you for your presence. So my name is Ken Daimaru. I'm associate professor in Japanese history at the University of Paris. And I'm working on the various health issues in the 20th century, increasing giving the natural world a greater role in my historical inquiry. Environmental history is a relatively young subdiscipline of history in comparison with other fields of historical researches. Its roots are in the protest movements and political activism of the second half of the 20th century that responded to the era of environmental and social problems. So three people presented in this panel today deal with environmental and ecological issues debated since the late 19th century to contemporary period from various approaches, political history, history of sciences, intellectual history, social and cultural history, and gender history. I remind you that this panel is recorded and each paper is 20 minutes. And finally, I, write, I invite you to use the Zoom or Uber chat function during the presentation, as well as a raise hand function during the Q&A session when you want to ask the question to the speaker. So the first paper will be presented by Dr. Rebecca Tompkins, who completed her PhD in modern Japanese studies at Leiden University in 2019, and is, she is currently rector in the Department of Intercultural Communication at Senshu University in Tokyo. Her research focuses on the intersection of gender, environmental issue, and the nation states in modern Japanese history, and her paper entitled From Conflict to Cooperation will examine the relationship between waste management experts, officials, citizens, and civil society groups in the first half of 20th century. Floor is yours, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Professor Daimaru. All right, um, so I'll share my slides to get started. Um, Sorry, one moment, please. Um, can you see that? Sorry, I'm going to restart that. I'm not sure if that worked. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, very sorry. All right, um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Tompkins. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the impact of citizen protests on Japanese waste management in the early 20th century. Uh, I'll first start by introducing a brief history of uh, waste management in Japan from 1900 until the 1930s. Uh, I'll then discuss a few examples of garbage conflicts um, and then how these shifted into cooperation of waste management officials with citizens and finally conclude by discussing uh, this shift in attitude. Okay, um, so first, waste management history. Uh, during the Meiji period, um, waste disposal was not a major priority for early Meiji leaders, uh, but the urban waste management systems also underwent modernization and industrialization toward the end of the Meiji period. Traditional methods of waste management, including open dumping, landfilling, ocean dumping, and use of waste as fertilizer or animal feed, continued largely, largely unchanged through the first few decades of Meiji, as national leaders and city planners focused on more pressing issues. However, rapid industrialization and urbanization resulted in a burgeoning amount of urban waste, which in many cities began to overwhelm traditional channels of waste disposal. As was the case in coastal cities around the world, dumping of waste in the ocean was a popular form of waste disposal in Japan, 
and the increasing pollution of bays and waterways prompted many cities to look to new technological solutions for the garbage problem. But the most direct impetus for the modernization of the waste management system mandated by the first national waste law in 1900, as well as for the designation of incineration as the preferred method of waste treatment was the spread of infectious disease, a topic that is very relevant to us all now. Um, a report by the Greater Japan Private Hygiene Association issued in 1888, entitled The Hygienic Conditions in the Homeland During the Previous Year, stated that the following three measures should be considered the foundation of cholera prevention. One, drainage of sewage. Two, the removal of filth. And three, the cleansing of garbage. These principles soon became the basis for national policies on urban sanitation and disease prevention. The first national law regulating waste management in Japan was the Waste Cleansing Law, Obutsu Sojiho, promulgated in 1900. It was passed as one of a series of measures designed to prevent the spread of disease, cholera in particular. Early efforts to regulate urban waste at the local level were often designed as protective measures against epidemics, and waste management was primarily discussed in terms of hygiene and public health. The waste cleansing law revolutionized urban waste management in Japan, and many of its stipulations have had a lasting effect to this day. First, the law placed the ultimate responsibility for waste collection and disposal on municipalities, shifting the burden of removing household waste from citizens to local governments. The law also established a system of sanitary inspectors who were to oversee and regulate sanitation work. The component of the waste cleansing law that has had perhaps the greatest influence on waste management in Japan was Article 5 of the law's implementation regulations, which recommended but did not require that waste be disposed of through incineration. Waste should, to the extent possible, be incinerated. At the time, incineration was considered the most sanitary method of waste disposal. The public health and sanitation experts who helped to draft this and other disease prevention laws at the time considered incineration to be an obvious and desirable solution to urban waste problems. In the end, the only method of waste treatment that fulfilled the conditions of being sanitary, large scale, and convenient was the incineration method. Uh, so in summary, uh, waste management policies uh, beginning in uh, 1900 through the early 1930s had a focus on hygiene, technical solutions, and state control. Focusing more specifically on Tokyo, in the first decade of the 20th century, garbage in Tokyo was collected from the waste containers of households, shops, and public spaces, and carried to one of 36 waste collection stations in the city. There it was divided into three categories, materials for fertilizer, valuable materials, and discards. Fertilizer was transported to nearby Chiba Prefecture, where it was sold to farmers. Valuable materials were typically gathered by workers and sold. The majority of the remaining discards were taken to a dump site in the Hirahisa area of Fukagawa Ward, which was established in 1901. The site was also periodically used for open-air garbage incineration, generally as an emergency measure during epidemics. But in 1910, the city established a more permanent open air incineration site at Echuji Macho, also in Fukagawa Ward. A survey of the waste management methods of 52 cities and 28 towns carried out by the Journal of the Greater Japan Private Hygiene Association at the end of 1900 revealed that at the time, only 13 cities and five towns had incineration facilities in Japan. Although not initially one of those cities, within a few years, Osaka emerged as the national leader in research and development on waste incineration. The first full-size incineration facility in Osaka was completed in 1903, three years after the promulgation of the waste cleansing law, and a second followed in 1907. By this time, the majority of the city's waste was incinerated. Researchers in the city continued to conduct experiments in order to refine incineration technology. Two new incinerators were built in 1916, 
And in 1919, these facilities were used to conduct experiments on electricity generation and dry distillation. Improved designs based on the findings of the Osaka research became the basis for new incineration facilities on the country. Uh, in Tokyo, however, following the waste cleansing law of 1900, uh, the city of Tokyo also made plans to construct modern incineration facilities in order to manage the large volume of waste more hygienically. But due to difficulties with siting, in particular opposition from residents, in addition to buzz budget constraints and other problems, these plans repeatedly failed to materialize. From 1903 to 1914, nine different candidate sites for the construction of a waste incinerator were proposed, but each was ultimately rejected. The first incinerator in Tokyo was the Osaki Waste Incineration Site built in 1924, uh, directly following the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, waste was dumped into the street or disposed of in waterways and disease caused by unsanitary conditions claimed yet more victims. Normal waste collection services did not resume for months. During this time, central municipal administration of sanitation and other services was impossible. And these duties were taken up by local governments and residential associations. The number one Fukagawa waste disposal plant, the first incinerator to be built and managed by the city of Tokyo and intended to serve a large proportion of the city rather than a single town or ward, began operations in 1929. The new facility was designed so that valuable waste would be separated from the rest before incineration. However, even the large capacity of the new facility was not enough to handle all of Tokyo's waste which by 1930 amounted to about 310,000 tons a year. These issues coincided with national level changes to waste management policy. In 1930, the waste cleansing law was amended in order to resolve the improvement of facilities related to waste disposal. The revised regulations changed the wording of the clause regarding the specified waste disposal method. The word narubeku to the extent possible was eliminated so that the reg regulation simply stated, waste should be incinerated. This change meant that incineration was essentially a requirement for municipalities like Tokyo that had the means to build incineration facilities. Given these policy changes and the overloaded state of the existing Fukagawa incinerator, the city of Tokyo quickly decided to build additional facilities. And in June, 1930, it was determined that two more incinerators would be built near the first. They were to be in the same style, but incorporating the latest technological improvements. The Fukagawa second and third waste disposal plants began operation in March, 1933. In addition to mandating incineration for municipal waste, the 1930 revision of the waste cleansing law provided that in cases where local authorities deemed it necessary, garbage should be separated into two containers, one for kitchen waste, chukai, and one for mixed waste, zakai, for separate collection. The main purpose of separate collection as implemented in Tokyo was the removal of kitchen waste, which was seen as the cause of a number of municipal waste problems. This provision was meant to ensure that incinerators could run more productively. The consensus among experts at the time was that many of the problems incineration facilities were facing, such as large quantities of smoke, excessive unburned residue, swarming flies and unpleasant smells, were caused by the high water content in food waste. By separating out kitchen waste, which was instead to be diverted to fertilizer and pig feed, the remaining mixed waste could be incinerated more efficiently. As of September, 1932, Kitchen waste comprised 35.4% of all waste in Tokyo. After experimental trials conducted in 1930 showed promising results in terms of preventing the generation of flies in the summertime, the city of Tokyo began implementing separate collection of kitchen waste and other waste in central areas of the city, comprising 70,000 households in June 1931. In July 1933, the area for separated collection was expanded to 100,000 households, and from 1934, separated collection was 
expanded to 420,000 households in the old city area and daily collection of kitchen waste was implemented year round. So that's the background of waste. And now we'll get into the conflicts um, that changed some uh, waste management authorities' opinion about the best way to do waste management. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Echijima, in Echijimacho um, in 1910, the city established an open air incineration dumping ground. Um, but by 1921, uh, citizens in the area uh, decided that uh, they did not appreciate having this dumping ground in their neighborhood. Uh, the smoke and pests generated by this open air garbage burning uh, caused frequent complaints from residents. And in 1921, an organization called the League for the Realization of the Abolition of Garbage Incineration Grounds attracted more than 30,000 members. Uh, an even bigger garbage conflict, the so-called Shibuya Meguro Garbage War, um, occurred uh, from 1924 to 1926. So although municipal and national authorities regarded incinerators as necessary and beneficial, local residents often did not agree and plans for incineration construction were frequently met with angry protests. One of the most prominent disputes over the construction of an incineration facility occurred between Shibuya Cho and Meguro Cho in the mid 1920s. This conflict uh, has been described as one of Tokyo's earliest garbage wars you may know of the more famous one that took place uh, in the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, in 1924, Shibuya Cho began planning to build a waste incinerator. Initially, a site was found within Shibuya and the land purchased, but after a vigorous protest from residents, the site was abandoned and planners instead chose a suitable location in neighboring Meguro Cho. They purchased the land and began construction of the facility there. Meguro residents protested, but as the facility had already received a permit from the Metropolitan Police Department, construction continued. The facility was completed in November 1925 and began running initial tests. When these resulted in clouds of black smoke and complaints of bad smells from hundreds of residents, the facility's permit, which stipulated that the incinerator produced no smoke and no smells, conditions essentially impossible for incineration technology at the time, was suspended until improvements could be made and further experiments run. When word spread in April 1926 that the Metropolitan Police Department was considering revoking the incineration facility's license altogether, the assemblies of Shibuya and Meguro began lobbying diet members of opposing political parties to encourage the police to favor their side of the dispute bringing the conflict to national attention and worsening relations between residents of the two areas. On 4th August 1926, residents from both areas had gathered at the facility to observe an incineration test, which was scheduled to end at 7 p.m. When the fires were still lit after the scheduled ending time, over 100 Megado residents began protesting. The group clashed with police and three Megado residents were arrested, but quickly released. Tensions were high, but negotiations between Shibuya and Meguro resulted in a reluctant compromise in December 1926. Under this agreement, Shibuya would pay 15,000 yen each year to Meguro, Meguro's garbage would be accepted at the incinerator without a fee, and Meguro institutions would be allowed to draw on Shibuya's water supply for free. The incinerator was in operation for less than five years before it was closed in 1932. Finally, um, perhaps the biggest uh, garbage problem of this time period, the Fukugawa smoke crisis by Mondai of 1933. As I mentioned earlier, the Fukugawa second and third waste incineration plants began operation in March, 1933. The two facilities combined began burning 750 tons of waste per day. The plants emitted a huge amount of foul smelling smoke and attracted flies in large numbers, making life miserable for local residents 
and business impossible for local shops and establishments. Citizen anger at the facilities grew and residents quickly started a protest movement. At a Tokyo City Assembly meeting, a representative of Fukugawa harshly criticized the city government. Why must only the citizens of Fukugawa take in all of the garbage from the 15 wards, suffering in a hell of smoke? On May 4th, 1933, the Tokyo edition of the Asahi Shimbun reported on the facilities with the headline, like a hell of smoke, all of Fukugawa cries out. On May 22nd, 1933, an assembly of ward residents approved a resolution entitled Abolish the Murderous Incinerator and presented this to the mayor of Tokyo the following day. In response, the city took measures such as limiting the plant's hours of operation and stopping the practice of open air burning in the facility's dumping ground. In June 1933, the city established a committee to investigate how to improve waste management techniques, and in September, it created an emergency investigative council for waste management facilities. The uproar over the Fukugawa waste facilities ultimately led to a push for educational campaigns and encouragement of cooperation from citizens by waste management authorities. So uh, now we'll move into examples of cooperation. So in response to the 1933 Fukugawa garbage crisis, um, the, a garbage campaign, Gomiundo, was organized by the Tokyo Women's League to Purify City Politics in cooperation with city waste management officials. The league organized a lecture series with an educational play about household waste separation, distributed thousands of flyers, assisted in the city's contest for a cleaning slogan, and even produced a movie about the garbage problem at the behest of city authorities. The city increasingly produced educational campaigns to encourage citizens to separate and reduce waste throughout the 1930s. And of course, uh, focus on waste reduction intensified during the war years, but that's not the focus of this paper. So here are some examples. Um, the following quotes from official documents published by city and local authorities in the 1930s demonstrate the new consensus among waste management officials that cooperation with citizens was absolutely essential for waste management. So from the Tokyo city office in 1935, rubbish disposal is essentially the sector that has the most intimate connection to every household. And in this respect, the understanding and cooperation of citizens is particularly necessary. Uh, in 1938, the Tokyo City Government Yearbook explained the meaning of public announcements on sanitation ideology as follows. The purpose of sanitation work is not simply to dispose of the waste and excrement of each household, but to create a bright, a clean, bright, livable city for people's daily lives. Without the cooperation of average citizens, it is impossible to pursue this. And for that reason, there is a need for public education on sanitation ideology. And finally, um, according to the 1939 Tokyo City Government Summary, sanitation can be said to be the barometer of culture. Therefore, by means of the sufficient understanding and cooperation of citizens, and the improvement and expansion of the city's facilities management, we can do nothing but hope for the construction of a bright and sanitary city as quickly as possible. So these are just a few examples of um, city officials uh, emphasizing the importance of citizen cooperation with waste management policies. So in conclusion, uh, we can see a clear shift in attitude among waste management officials from the early 1900s uh, when it was when the common view was that waste management could be accomplished with the right technology and regulations and the burden was on the state uh, to produce correct waste management. However, by the 1930s, um, we can see that uh, city officials and waste management experts had concluded that citizen cooperation is absolutely necessary in order to properly fulfill waste management. Um, 
One of the major reasons for this shift was the law that required incineration and source separation, bumbetsu, as part of waste management. Um, source separation, uh, as implemented in Japan, requires the active participation, or some may say unpaid labor, of the majority of residents in order to be affected. The 1933 women's garbage campaign played a significant role in popularizing the idea that garbage separation is rightfully the civic and moral duty of citizens, especially housewives, in Tokyo and other cities. Educational campaigns and publications from city authorities subsequently reinforced this message and established, perhaps permanently, the concept of citizen cooperation and active participation as a necessary aspect of waste management. So as you all probably know, this attitude, as well as the prominence of incineration and source separation, remain central features of waste management in Japan today. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rebecca, for your very interesting paper and also a very important chronological insight. And uh, uh, next paper will be presented by Julia Mariko Jacopi. And Mariko is a historian of modern Japan, specializing in history of science and environmental history. And she recently submitted her dissertation on disaster prevention in Japan. And uh, in her dissertation, so she looked at the impact of natural disaster on Japanese society and the implementation of the strategy against them and how disconnected to the global production and circulation of disaster related knowledge. So today's her talk is entitled Shaped by Sismicity and she will discuss the history of Japanese sismology since its institutionalization in the late 19th century and its law within the international scientific community to pursue active law in science diplomacy and to maintain transnational relationship based on this knowledge. So floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ken, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the organizers, the technical team and volunteers um, who make this digital conference possible. And thank you very much to all the participants who are joining us today for uh, the last uh, panel um, of uh, the conference. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here, at least digitally, and giving the opportunity to present my work. Um, so when I submitted my abstract, um, I was in the process of writing and revising um, the article um, that the talk is based today, but in the meantime, it has been published. And so, um, yeah, uh, so I'm just taking this opportunity to, to shamelessly advertise <laughs> my um, article. Um, a few months after the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, the San Francisco call announced, the world's greatest seismologist says San Francisco is safe. Featuring a large photograph of Japanese seismologist Omori Sakichi, the article quoted Omori saying that uh, the earthquake had removed the great region's great instability and that San Francisco would be a very safe place for a long time. How was it possible that a Japanese scientist was hailed as the best of his profession and seen as the most reliable expert to calm the concerns of distraught San Franciscans? This is especially remarkable because this happened during the height of the yellow peril and widespread racism towards Asian immigrants. Omori himself was hit by local boys with stones during his research trip to the San Francisco earthquake. This episode illustrates how Japan used the image of scientific superiority to elevate its international status or in short, employ a form of science diplomacy. The small discipline of seismology was an important field of Japanese science diplomacy, taking advantage of the constantly active seismic environment of the Japanese archipelago. Besides providing a wealth of seismic data, the environment also supported re the reiterated claim that Japan had experience with earthquake proof construction. So I'm, I'm building on, on works here. Um, 
Gregory Plancy has shown that after the great Novi earthquake of 1891 had revealed the vulnerability of Western architecture to earthquakes, the Japanese formed an identity as an earthquake nation based on the belief that its cultural ability enabled it to master its seismic environment. Um, subsequently, uh, seismology and earthquake proof construction and later earthquake engineering became important scientific disciplines which were better funded and promoted than in most other countries. As Kim Bomsung has shown, shown, this laid the groundwork for Japan's competitive ability in the earthquake sciences and Japanese scientists to position themselves as teachers, even for Western countries. The earthquake sciences thus become became an important field of science diplomacy in the 20th century, sustaining Japan's influence in an increasingly globalized world of science. Um, science diplomacy here refers to all forms of science-related cross-border activities and communication with the goal to serve the interests of a nation. Its goal is to support a nation's diplomacy, that would be science for diplomacy, or to promote its research through transnational um, networks, which would be diplomacy for science. The analytical framework of science diplomacy not only draws attention to the transnational agency and importance of individual scientists in building up the soft power of a nation. It also helps to shed light on the ways um, in which science was used to both maintain um, Japanese presence in international affairs or to structure power relations, both to subvert Western superiority superiority and to establish imperial structures. Finally, by concentrating on the earthquake sciences, I also look at the environment as a structuring element in transnational relations and international diplomacy. So in this paper, um, I will look on the foundations of Japanese science diplomacy in the Meiji period, um, the Japanese science diplomacy in the interwar years, and the post-war establishment of Japan as a hub for the international distribution of earthquake knowledge, which it is today. Um, deviating from the common narrative that Western sciences was transferred to Japan during the Meiji Restoration um, reforms, uh, Japan could claim an important role during the formation of the discipline of seismology. The key lay in instrumentation. Before seismographs became the standard for earthquake measurements, European seismology had mostly been observational, meaning that it relied on observations of damage in buildings and interviews with witnesses. In Japan, British engineering and mining oratory John Milne become, began pushing for instrumental observation in 1880 when he observed that Japanese building and society responded differently to um, earthquakes than their Western counterparts. Milne, with other engineers, subsequently developed the horizontal pendulum seismograph and introduced it in meteorological observatories everywhere in Japan beginning in 1883. Consequently, Japan became the first country with nationwide seismograph coverage. Um, later, Milne later extended this network to a global scale. Um, nevertheless, Japan remained the country with the most uh, seismological observatories, which provided nearly constant seismicity. Thus, Japan became the first laboratory for earthquake science, a fact that also gave leverage to Japanese seismologists. So because of Milne's groundwork, uh, Japan had a head start in when the field of seismology formed into a scientific discipline. Um, meanwhile, the young Meiji state supported this process because it neatly fit its diplomatic ambitions. The science would serve as an arena to demonstrate how Japan had become a civilized nation, aiding the task to repeal the unequal treaties. To compete in the scientific race of the empires, Japanese scientists often employed the strategy to promote locally relevant research topics to carve out their own international niche. Um, the Japanese state therefore actively promoted seismology as a field pioneered by Japan. Um, when the Imperial University of Tokyo was founded in 1886, it also set up the worst the world's first chair of seismology. Five years la later, the government established the Imperial Earthquake Investigation Committee, the IEIC, a pure pioneering multidisciplinary research institution to 
promote basic research into earthquakes and mitigate their effects by developing earthquake proof construction and earthquake prediction. Knowledge claimed to be neglected by their Western teachers who use seismology mostly to investigate the earth interior instead of developing practical applications. The committee was welcomed by Western seismologists as pioneering and even as a potential model. Um, based on the authority of this locally generated earthquake knowledge provided, um, Japanese seismology began to be used in science diplomacy around 1900. Uh, its foundations were laid almost single-handedly by mentioned Omori Sakichi, who in turn used his transnational activities to become the undisputed authority in his field, both abroad and at home. A prolific writer, he penned countless articles in English for the English publications for the IAIC. Beginning in 1897, he was sent to examine large-scale earthquakes all over the world, including in Western countries. Thus, he, could, he not only acquired knowledge on a global scale to strengthen his authority, but he also got the opportunity to demonstrate the universal applicability of Japanese local knowledge in the global context. For example, Omori used his writings on these missions to assert that Japanese earthquake knowledge outperformed local building traditions, establishing Japan as a teacher of earthquake proof construction, both in the colonial context of Taiwan and towards the West in the case of the earthquake of Messina. During this, these missions, Omori presented himself as a quasi political representative of his country. He was keenly aware that his missions served political purposes. Through his authority as one of the, most, mo the world's most respected figures in his field, he represented Japan as a member of the civilized nations. Omori stressed this point during the inaugural meeting of the International Seismological Association in 1901, when he pushed for changing the structure of the plant association from personal membership to state membership. Thus, he not only demonstrated that Japan was capable to, capable to dictate how an international scientific association was run, but also affirmed the role of the seismologist as a representative of his country. After the great Kanto earthquake in 19, happened in 1923 and Omori died shortly thereafter, Japanese seismology reached a turning point. Engineering and physics oriented approaches became more important. A new earthquake research institute, ERI, was founded in cooperation with Mitsubishi in 1925 and also situated at the University of Tokyo. Um, this laid the groundwork for the new discipline of earthquake engineering. Um, Japanese seismologists still continue to engage in an international earthquake research missions as Omori had done before, but science diplomacy gained even more importance as the internationalist atmosphere of the in interwar period, both in diplomacy for science and in science for diplomacy. Um, engineers gained political importance in the 1920s and also pursued their own form of technocratic internationalism, the idea of peaceful cooperation um, based on technological networks. In 1929, the World Engineering Congress was held in Tokyo for the first time outside of Europe or the US. At the Congress, former president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, John Ripley Fre Freeman, learned that the ERI was designing a new type of seismograph that could measure earthquake motion within buildings. Back in the US, he drafted a systematic program on how to organize knowledge transfer um, and adaptation from the Japanese earthquake sciences, which is quite reminiscent of uh, the Meiji knowledge transfer to Japan. Most importantly, the society invited ERI director Suehiro Kyoji on a lecture tour across the US in 1931. Um, he, Suhiro also met with the Department of Seismology of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey to um, discuss the design of future strong motion seismographs. In his lectures, um, Suhiro stressed that he had come to express the goodwill of Japan to the United States through science and voiced his hopes for quick advances in advances in earthquake science for the well-being of the people of seismic countries. 
Given the Japanese government's unwillingness to invest more funds into developing song, strong motion seismographs, he sought to push American colleagues into more research on the new technology and gave straightforward advice on the problem research would have to address. While the tour took place within the framework of serving the nation, um, Japan was still presented as a teacher to the US. Um, Suehiro was able to pursue his own agenda, advancing research and maintaining good relations with US researchers amidst the growing diplomatic tensions of the 1930s. However, from the 1930s onwards, Japanese seismology also got enlisted in diplomatic endeavors for the expansionist Japanese empire. One central purpose of these initiatives was to present Japan as a scientifically skilled alternative model to the white powers. Um, for example, Ethiopian foreign minister um, Herui Welde Silase, butchering the name, sorry, uh, visited Japan in 1931 to establish dip diplomatic ties. Japan was interested in trade with Ethiopia, while Ethiopia hoped for Japanese military assistance and advice to counter the Italian outreach. In Japan, Selassie not only met up with Japanese diplomats and military personnel, but also taken to a sightseeing trip that included Tokyo University and the Ueno Zoo. Um, there, the Ethiopian delegation visited the ERI. Although an alliance with Ethiopia did not come to fruition, this episode shows how Japan's diplomacy used seismology as a tool to represent Japan as a modernized country that could very well serve as a model and advisor for Ethiopia. Uh, seismology was also used to strengthen the friendship between the Axis powers, especially with Italy, um, fellow seismic country. In 1937, ERI director Ishimoto Michio was choos chosen to act as an official Italo-Japanese exchange professor to foster the scientific exchange between the two seismic countries. Ishimoto held public lectures on Japanese seismology in Rome and Naples in 1938, received the degree of Grand Officer of the Order of the Crown of Italy, and remained active in Italo-Japanese cultural associations until his death in 1940. Um, Post-war science diplomacy in the earthquake sciences re-established itself quickly thanks to the strong interwar ties to uh, US scientists forged by Suehiro and his colleagues. By the 1960s, Japan was developed into the global center of, for research on earthquake engineering and for dissemination of earthquake knowledge. After a first world conference on earthquake engineering was held in California in 1956, Japanese delegates in, insisted on following it up with a second conference in Japan, which was held in Tokyo in 1960. The opening speeches all evoked earthquake science's duty to serve the welfare of mankind and save it from disasters, echoing and expanding upon the rhetoric Suahiro had used during his lecture tour in 1931. Conference chairman um, Muto Kiyoshi successfully lobbied to create a permanent network, which was founded at the International Association for, for Earthquake Engineering in 1963. The association was again structured as a head organization of national associations, now with its central office in Tokyo. In the following years, Japan became a central provider of knowledge and technical training in earthquake engineering for developing countries. In 1962, following a proposal from the Japanese government to the UNESCO, the International Institute for Seismology and Earthquake Engineering, IISEE, was created within the architecture department of the University of Tokyo. The goal of this institute was to improve education in earthquake sciences for developing countries, for which the UNESCO awarded fellowships. As the United Nations Development Program put it, Japan was an ideal for this purpose since it's, it is situated in one of the most active seismic zones of the world and its scientists and engineers have acquired a high reputation and already acquired a valuable experience in dealing with the special problem of training people from different countries. Since then, over 1,600 fellows have completed the program. 
um, Japanese official development assistance also participated at the IISEE project and began to support earthquake prevention in the 1960s. Continuing pre-war practices, delegations of earthquake scientists were sent to study major earthquakes abroad and provide knowledge to assist reconstruction. In the high profile case of the Skopje earthquake of 1963, Japanese scientists studied the aftermath of the earthquake, gave advice on how to rebuild an, in an earthquake resistant way and provided teaching staff for, for an earthquake engineering institute that was newly founded in Skopje in 1964. Famed Japanese architect Tange Kenzo was commissioned to plan large sections of the reconstruction. Since the 1980s, um, disaster relief became a fixed pillar of the Japanese International Cooperation Agency's assistance program, which includes assistance in earthquake resistant reconstruction all over the world. Conclusion. Um, the earthquake sciences have played an important role in Japanese science diplomacy since the Meiji period and helped to accumulate cultural capital, which Japan still draws on from today. And the foundations were laid in the late 19th century when an emerging Japanese earthquake science allowed Japan to establish itself in a niche where the non-Western uh, country could exert authority over the Western powers. Um, Japanese researchers were recognized for their expertise, especially as teachers of um, earthquake proof construction, independent, independent of the shifting geopolitical circumstances. While in the pre-war period, science diplomacy um, served to legitimize civilized Japan's colonial rule over East Asia and aided for forging political alliances, Post-war earthquake sciences depicted Japan as a peaceful, developed country coming to the aid of less knowledgeable countries in need. Um, the long-term cooperation with the US um, concerning seismology also facilitated uh, Japan's resurgence after the Second World War. Um, however, Japanese science diplomacy operated still within a world dominated by Western science and the strategy to build up a niche science based on local expertise did not seriously challenge the assumed leadership of Western science in general. Um, thank you for your attention and in case you're interested in more details and fun anecdotes I left out, out from uh, my presentation, you can find my article in the Journal of Contemporary History. Thank you. Thank you, Mar Mariko, for your very rich and stimulating paper and on uh, and highlighting on transnational flow of knowledge and actor. And maybe uh, you can also use the chat. So, so I, I see some. Uh, if you have a question, very specific question to Mariko, so don't hesitate to write to write on the chat. So and next and last paper will be presented by Dr. So Simona Lukminate. And uh, she, uh, after studying Japanese studies degree in Manchester, so she has been studying and working in Japan for 10 years, and she completed a PhD thesis at the University of Osaka and work in the, worked in the field of the inter intellectual history. And uh, so environmental history is uh, part of her new research project, if I... I understand well, and she currently works at the University of Hillwood Center for Global Engagement. So today's paper entitled Pollution from Women's Perspective is drawn on historical material from the various media and explore the perspective of women and those who advocated for them to see how the perception of gendered role was used uh, as a tool in action aimed at protecting the environment since the uh, major period to the contemporary Japan. Floor is yours. Thank you, Ken, for the kind introduction. I would just like to confirm with you uh, how much time do I have? 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes, okay. All right, so I'll start. So hello, everyone. I'm going to share my slides. I hope you can see them. So uh, Ken has introduced me already, but I'm Simona and I'm not entirely comfortable, I guess, speaking about this topic just yet. I'm just, uh, I guess, dipping my toes into the ocean. 
but I would like to hear your um, ideas and your insights about this. So what I have been working on so far was mostly uh, ideas about women's education. And while doing that, I have come across um, the writing about uh, envi environmental issues. And um, obviously I became quite intrigued about the change uh, in the thought process, like, you know, as I'm somebody who's working in intellectual history um, about pollution. And um, I won't be looking into all of the aspects today because it's such a broad topic. But what I will do, I will focus uh, a little bit on the perspective of uh, women themselves as activists, about perspective about them by um, people who um, promoted uh, education for women uh, during the Meiji period. And I will also uh, provide some examples about how they have been, um, how the issues of pollution itself have been um, depicted uh, in various media. Right. Um, so first of all, we know that uh, scientifically speaking, men and women are differently affected, affected by toxin exposure. And that gender difference in environmental concern is due to differentially perceived vulnerability to risk, right? It's not entirely um, connected to how we perform as gendered subjects. It is not really how society enforces uh, gender norms on us in general terms. It is more about how we perceive um, our livelihoods, um, the livelihoods of our families, our security, etc. However, if we look at um, how pollution and environmental issues are advocated uh, in Japan, there's a strong emphasis on motherhood. And uh, as I have looked into the development on the perception of a woman as a mother uh, in particular from the Meiji period uh, called the Ryosai Kenbo ideology. I would like to just um, emphasize that today and to give you some food for thought about how that may have shaped and is most likely still shaping about how women are speaking about um, their exposure to uh, natural disasters and pollution uh, incidents in general. So uh, you probably all know as your copper mine incident. Um, it became a very big movement during the Meiji period. And um, the school that I have focused my research on, Meiji Jogakko, has been uh, it, uh, involved and affected uh, by this incident to an extent that uh, it really um, hindered the uh, activities of the school and uh, it's just interesting to me to see that a woman's school was so active in speaking out about uh, the environmental issues and how they were doing that. So uh, what is interesting is that at that time, at the beginning of um, majority of these incidents that we know of uh, in, let's say, um, modernizing Japan in about 1950s, 60s, uh, there was still a lot of hope <laughs> uh, from the populace on um, the acts of the government. So the government was new, uh, fairly liberal <laughs> at that time, was perceived as something that people could contribute to uh, with their opinions and their actions. So uh, there was this shift from, you know, the emperor is going to look after us, the government is there to represent us to oh no, we have to do something ourselves. So um, yeah, there was censorship and um, just trying to spread information, uh, spread knowledge about these incidents was also something that came under the jurisdiction of um, the government, right? So the government would then kind of filter out uh, what is happening. We could say that there is still um, possibly an issue 
uh, in Japan, maybe in other countries as well. But that relationship with the government is still something I think that is a little bit painful when it comes to um, experiences told by people who have um, undergone these um, issues. So uh, when Jogaku Zashi, uh, the first magazine for women, uh, published uh, about this uh, incident, uh, Iwamoto Yoshiharu, the head editor, spoke about how women are unable to feed their babies and how they're dying while crying and that kind of thing. So the imagery was very strong. Um, it definitely concentrated on the weak ones, on the, on the mothers and their children. And I would say that still persists to a certain extent. If you look at the visuals uh, that I'll show you a little bit later as well. Um, yes, so as I mentioned, um, the school, the magazine that the school published received um, uh, like strong criticism and um, uh, they couldn't um, function properly for uh, about half a year because of this. Uh, interestingly, uh, quite recently, I guess, in 2014, uh, there has been an uh, NHK drama that dramatized um, this whole incident. Uh, if you are aware, great. If you're not, maybe <laughs> have a look. It is still available on the internet. So um, it's interesting to me to see that um, IMDb um, describes it as um, you know, a story about a village that was abolished by the government, right? So, you know, there's still that like, well, government didn't really do anything kind of thing. Uh, so the story is about Nita Sachi, who is fighting for her uh, land, I guess. Uh, and she is cooperating with other women and uh, they kind of left uh, to fend for themselves. But um, it's interesting to see that it's obviously like much more feminist depiction than it was in Meiji period. Uh, women are speaking for themselves and women are doing um, things like, you know, they are participating in um, all sorts of, all forms of activism, etc. in the depiction, right? Obviously reality is not necessarily as rosy as we will see, but uh, as a movie, the female protagonist was chosen uh, to depict uh, the incident. Right, so sorry, this is a uh, very rich in text, but I just wanted to mention that, um, yes, so um, essentially what has happened around that time uh, when we speak about intellectual history is that um, before an incident would be something that would be, um, you know, like there would be like a monetary, uh, like monetary factor would be involved. So, you know, like you have uh, suffered as an individual, therefore you have this, uh, these finances from the government kind of thing, right? Uh, however, when we started to see these large scale um, uh, pollution incidents, what has happened is it became very difficult to identify the victims and um, this prevented, I guess, the government from uh, addressing the issues successfully. And if you can see um, at the bottom, uh, I mentioned Bokokuron as well. So around that time, around 1900s, uh, people started speaking about um, how this is a national crisis. Uh, it is the nation that is suffering. It is not people in that area, but the unit, right? So if we look at it, um, you know, at the larger and larger issues, obviously it becomes clear that it's very hard to identify who needs to be protected from what and at what timing and in, in what way. And that prevents um, the clear solving of the issue. Right, so uh, if we look at parallels uh, a little bit later, uh, hibakusha, uh, which are invoked by um, women who have suffered through the Fukushima disaster as well, um, they have shared stories quite vocally about um, how 
they could not fulfill that role of a mother or a wife, etc. So I'm going to give you an example of Hayashi Kyoko's um, masks of what you call it. And uh, it is a very um, strongly worded uh, piece. So um, the author um, speaks about Takako, who had an arranged marriage, which was rare, and uh, how, it, how difficult it was for women to get married. Um, she also speaks about uh, child rearing, uh, usually like the, the, whole, the whole story goes uh, about how men are unreliable in this, how they kind of left the women to fend for themselves, like, oh, you want to have a child, have a child, I'm not going to look after it him or her if they're disfigured or otherwise unwell you know there is that um emphasis on being a woman who's responsible for being uh, tainted for being polluted um and i think that is a very strong element that reappears in the like various media right also there is um the uh, the element of the loss of, uh, I guess, maybe social standing as well, like, you know, not being able to be fully human, not being able to be fully functional in the family and the society, and um, kind of extending that onto their children as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting read. Um, also, Odaka na Nichijo, like I'm jumping topics, but this is um, already about Fukushima nuclear accident. And there are um, definitely strong overlaps, uh, you know, looking at other stories as well. So, um, you know, women are kind of left to fend for themselves and to gather with other women, but at the same, other women may not be of the same kind of opinion. So in Odayaka na Nichijo, um, you can see again, like very strong imagery of, um, you know, a mother struggling essentially, right? Like not being uh, sure what to do left to her own devices. Uh, if we look at the photographs, at the imagery as well, that became, um, you know, the signature imagery of various pollution disasters, we also um, see a, a mother being canonized as representative of um, the disease, as the like <laughs> canonized victim of the disease who has to look after the affected children. Right, so uh, again, if you, if you look at other uh, photographs, majority of them are looking at at women. These are the most heart-wrenching photographs of, of women uh, with their babies, um, getting them checked if they are healthy uh, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, we can see from the major period that there is an emphasis on women suffering, uh, both maybe <laughs> from women and about women. Uh, right, and the common topics are helplessness, anguish in terms of marriage, child rearing, and just loss of um, functions as, as a woman, essentially, right? And not being able to give birth, not being able to uh, be healthy and then um, thrive. Uh, yes, even though um, the freedom to express oneself has improved since Meiji, uh, we can see from the the way that the Fukushima disaster victims were dealt with, um, it is still very difficult for them to um, express themselves as full, um, like non-gendered <laughs> uh, participants in the society. And another thing that I found interesting, um, I might be wrong, but these movies that I have, uh, or the novella that I have chanced upon, even while having received numerous uh, prizes, they're not very well known, I believe, and there's not much, um, uh, I guess, usage of them in terms of educating uh, about what happens after uh, disasters as such. Right.
Right, so I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of, <laughs> not my own, but uh, very interesting research that was carried out by Sofia University Institute of Comparative Culture. Uh, it happened not too long ago, uh, I managed to attend, and it was about women speaking up for Fukushima then and now. Okay, so if you are interested, um, they have a beautiful collection of um, women's voices from Tohoku in Tohoku Kala no Koe. So uh, just to give you some uh, insight into their research. So Maya Hauser spoke about the proximity of danger, right? If we look at women um, who are closer uh, to the danger, uh, it is, and, and compare them with those who are further from danger, uh, they would be reacting to the issues differently, right? Um, there's an emphasis uh, in their um, <clears throat> statements that they want to be futsu no mama, they just want to be like the regular mother and just move on and forget that anguish and not to be seen as somebody who's um, overthinking things. There's also the responsibility of the community, right? Uh, you have to be a member of the community to function uh, within. Um, you know, to function fully, <laughs> I guess, to have a comfortable um, life uh, in your area, right? So it was uh, very hard for women to speak up about their issues. And because of that, they have often been silenced. Um, and interestingly, it was not really the official risk assessment that uh, influenced them about their, like for their decisions about whether to drink the water, whether to eat the locally grown rice, but what the community was doing. So they had to fit in and do what others were doing and they felt comforted if somebody was similar to them and they have built networks based on that kind of affinity of similar attitudes to the risk. Um, Rebecca Milner spoke about how women are picking their battles. Uh, so they are fighting as mothers rather than somebody going against the system because the political um, establishment and the um, economical conditions of the region are not really allowing them to be full, um, I guess, outspoken participants in the issue. Right. Uh, also, the passage of time, because it's been 10 years, uh, has made it difficult to speak up. And women tend to have uh, informal gatherings rather than uh, organized meetings. Satsukuna spoke about how women are using emotions and not scientific data uh, to speak about uh, nature, children, shared responsibility and how they're drawing parallels with Fukushima, sorry, between Fukushima and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, as women, they are using politicize, <laughs> as women, they're using giving birth as a political argument, right? So um, yeah, Bose maternal instinct is something that they're also applying to argue for having their rights met, I guess. Right, so if we look at the persisting tendencies from Meiji, um, we could say that um, the imagery, at least from my experience, tends to still heavily rely on uh, women. Um, if we look at uh, the movies, if we look at the novellas, etc., women are those who are bearing the brunt of it, and they are those who are used uh, as the victim the, the passive receiver, I guess, of larger movements within the nation, such as uh, expansionism or uh, war or just economic, um, I guess, attempts, <laughs> right? So uh, when we look at what women are doing, it still seems that they are applying these roles of uh, a woman, of a mother, uh, and kind of hiding that activist um, label away somewhere and not really wanting to call themselves activists, because that is a very negative uh, 
image and uh, it makes it harder for them to be part of their society. And there's also some sort of um, distrust uh, with the larger um, uh, institution of the government and women seem to be finding um, one another uh, to rely on rather than uh, asking for the government or the companies who are maybe responsible for the issues to pr provide them with social security and support. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, Simona, for 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 your presentation, which lays actually the many theme of the discussion, and also the I, I remind you that Rebecca also I think uh, mentioned the role of housewives in waste management. So I think there are many uh, things that we can also uh, come back. So I just make a general comments and uh, open uh, discussion. So so wide spectrum of reaction society uh, so facing environmental and ecological issues, so including the fear, stigmatization, protection, knowledge production, education, and fight and solidarity, inherit environmental knowledge, institution, practice, and culture forged during the during previous period in various geographical context. And the three presentation, each in its own way, situates the Japanese experience in its broader ecological context and test the transgenerational and transnational character of its experience. So marked by circulation of debates, model and observer, cross fertilization of local, national and international learning, their appropriation, and finally the chain effect of representation. And research on environmental history lays a problem of the visibility and the invisibility of practice and actor. And this is why, so in some presentation, very clear that the actors who are at the, at the heart of the investigation and the world, world we use to talk about environment and ecology also are revealing our relationship to ourselves and to the other. So um, diversity of local situation is both an asset and also a disadvantage. The field of environmental history is often too scattered and is also highly specialized and localized and multiplicity of actor and their network require a specific survey method, which often need to be invented. So now I'd like to open the discussion by asking two questions because uh, time is, I think, learning. And I think your audience has many questions. But uh, um, the first question is uh, about your, the source, the historical material actually that you're using. So environmental history traditionally draw uh, heavily on the accumulated work of geographer or natural scientist, anthropologist and other experts, as well as public, Office archive and in the, in the today's case also the newspaper. But what are the sources like? Are you using uh, or do you intend to use in current research? And what are the historical material that you haven't used yet, but to be maybe specially mentioned for future historical research in this field? So this is my first question. My second question is the notion of public space which is central, I think, to in the environmental history, but although the term was not explicitly mentioned uh, in this today's talk, and the issue of public, the general public, citizen community, consumer society, participatory science, or role of experts are all questions we are facing today, we are asking today. So does understanding of ecology and environmental slow the lens of Japanese history help us to better understand public space, while avoiding the idealized theoretical public spaces. So this is my two broader question, actually, to three of them. But maybe if you can give some elements of response or, or not, and maybe we can move, to, we can also uh, give, give the voice to the, to, to the audience. Um, shall I go first? So to answer your first question, Ken. Um, so in addition to the newspaper articles I showed, um, my primary sources, um, it's very nice. The city of Tokyo and several other large cities um, have 
very well kept documents. Um, so there's actually a, a full, it's 4,000 page um, accumulation. Uh, it's called um, the Tokyo Seiso Jigyo Hyakunenshi. So 100 years of uh, waste work in Tokyo. Um, and it has all of the primary documents from this time period. So that was very helpful, as well as um, specifically regarding the women's garbage movement. Um, I used archival materials from the uh, Ichikawa Fusai Memorial Archive, um, specifically uh, Fusen and Jose Tembo um, magazines. So I went there and got copies. Yeah. And uh, your second question about um, ecology. Um, so for my paper, um, at this time in the 1920s and 1930s, um, waste specific, wa specifically, um, unlike industrial pollution or industrial waste, household waste was not seen as connected to the environment as we see it today. It was considered more of a social issue, um, specifically one for cities because rural areas did not have such big problems with waste disposal unless it was industrial pollution. That's all. Uh, you got us some very, um, yeah, thought-provoking and difficult question. I think I will have to to ponder about them uh, a bit, like longer in the future. Um, yeah, I think uh, I moved mostly uh, um, what you mentioned. It, it's mostly based on on the scientific writings of uh, my seismologists. I'm also um, try to work myself into the fields before um, and also kind of look at how, how it is, uh, yeah, it is uh, thought about today and then kind of go through uh, like all the kind of historical um, periods to kind of see how, how this perception of, of um, the research object changes. Um, also looking a lot of, uh, of government and municipal materials um, and um, what I also find very important for an environmental historian, not even if, if you're really, really using it in your writing, but I, I find it very important to kind of go to the places if possible, to kind of uh, get a feeling about like how um, the disaster have changed the environment or the improvement works um, um, to just, just gain some kind of grab on it on or in the case of Japan, um, most dams <laughs> and um, uh, infrastructure um, facilities also have uh, some kind of um, outreach propaganda place um, um, where you can kind of inform yourself about um, how, how it is dealt with the environment, which I also find a very uh, valuable source I found for um, my uh, my dissertation mostly not so much for this paper um yeah and the second i just i don't have a good idea i'm sorry <laughs> i'll just give over to simona thank you Marika. <laughs> thank you like i think what i personally would be most interested in would be looking at more testimonials because they are valuable uh if you look at kibakusha archives and um, the voices from uh, Fukushima, voices from Tohoku that I have mentioned. Um, you know, there are people who are going and talking to these women, like who are talking to these people, I guess, about their experiences and about what they have gone through. And I think this is a very valuable resource. I personally have been working on uh, Meiji period journalism. So um, while there has been quite um, large extent of censorship enforced, I still think that um, that sort of public discourse is also something that's very interesting. So, you know, just looking throughout um, the maybe different depictions, historically speaking about, um, sorry, of, of the experiences of these uh, natural disasters and uh, pollution incidents, etc., is something that I would personally like to do and something that I could recommend and um, yeah, regarding public spaces, right? Could you could you paraphrase it for me? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Your second question. Oh, the the the, the how, what what could be the contribution actually of the in, in environmental history in our understanding mm -hmm. of actually public space in Japan? That if mm -hmm. it's it, 
I, I wish I wanted to just to open the discussion, but if it's not too inspiring <laughs> question, sorry. we can also I didn't, have a... I didn't mean to put it put you on the spot. Um, I think, well, this is a very difficult question to answer. Obviously, like if we have uh, anybody in the audience who could speak about it, it would be great. Uh, the way I see public spaces is just, um, I guess, places where people can gather like we are gathering now and exchanging opinions freely and without any fear of being um, told to, you know, keep their thoughts to themselves and without being ostracized in any way in their communities. So what I would like to see um, would be more discussions as such about what people have experienced about the difficulties that they have gone through and uh, you know how to avoid those, how to deal with those. I think it's, it's very important to be open and honest about these kinds of issues. So if we could have some sort of gatherings, um, you know, I think I would personally be very keen to participate in something like that. Thank you. So now maybe I'm, we move to the q and session and maybe James Morris, so you put the question to, I think, uh, if I understand, to Rebecca. If you can maybe uh, just, uh, yeah, but take a take her. Yeah, um, actually, I, I think she already answers it in um, the response um, that she gave to your question just now. Um, so perhaps it, it doesn't need to be addressed. Um, it seems that um, I, I, yeah, I just wondered if there was any connection between industrial pollution and the way that um, um, household waste was also treated. But um, we were told just now that um, they were treated as very different things. So. <laughs> no worries, we can jump onto other people's questions, but thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, at the specific time period that I'm looking at in this paper, they were not really considered the same thing, but later, of course, um, garbage becomes more of an environmental or ecological issue, um, but not really in the pre-war period. Thank you. Eiko, uh, Eiko Honda-san. Hi, um, thank you very much for all the excellent papers. Hi, Mariko. Um, yeah, so I have a question to Rebecca, and uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about uh, who exactly were behind these uh, excellent activisms. And uh, I, I feel that we all have a tendency to uh, use this monolithic idea of women uh, or housewives, but um, uh, a bit like how Simona did, uh, how can we, you know, deconstruct this? notion and then you know who are exactly behind these uh, ideas thank you yeah um so i didn't focus too much on the women activists because i actually have a whole separate paper about that um so yes you're right um actually these activists were um ichikawa fusai kanako shigeri and other members of uh fusen kakutokudome the um League for Women's Suffrage in Japan at this time, who started this garbage campaign. And so in my other paper, I specifically argue that they used this uh, opportunity, the garbage problem, um, and allied themselves with the Tokyo municipal authorities in order to give themselves a bigger role in public life um, as part of their goal of achieving women's suffrage. Um, so yes not just stereotypical housewives, but they did specifically use, um, kind of like Simona was mentioning, um, the idea of women as mothers uh, or as particularly suited to cleaning or to purity um, as a reason why women specifically should be involved in municipal waste management as well. Oh, great, thank you. Fascinating. Could you put the uh, details of paper in the chat? I'd love to read it. Oh yeah, I'll yeah I'll send uh, the title. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Alexandra she uh, also posed a question to I think Lebeker and Simona. So if you can just briefly summarize your question to each of them. Um, yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. Um, I would have three questions um, for Rebecca first. Uh, the first one being, uh, were plastic as well as heavy chemical waste incinerated too? I think you already briefly touched upon um, this question earlier. Um, and then a the second question being, what were the consequences of incinerations on the health and environment of Japanese citizens as well as the flora and fauna? Um, 
Did incinerations of waste go along with a rise in cancer cases for closely living inhabitants and the disappearance of certain plants? The background of this question is that in France, for example, there have been studies that prove that incineration is extremely unhealthy and contributed to the disappearance of a certain amount of flora and fauna, which is why I'm interested in knowing whether the Japanese society also um, had concerns re uh, re remind regarding these issues. And then the last question would be, where did you find those old newspaper articles, whether you use Cross Asia or another, um, another website? Thank you very much. Yeah, I can briefly answer these. Um, so plastic was not in common use at the time period uh, that I look at in my paper. And um, I'm specifically focusing on household waste or municipal waste rather than industrial waste. Um, so there's not so much heavy chemical waste in what I looked at. So it's um, more likely like in the Ashio copper mine incident, like industrial pollution is where you will find those heavy chemicals. Um, uh, that were being dumped or maybe burned um, and causing a lot of problems. Um, yeah, so at this time, so um, just specifically the household and municipal waste, um, because there was not plastic commonly used, um, the main health concerns at that time were like breathing related because of the heavy smoke from incineration rather than um, now we have concerns of cancer, et cetera. So in Japan, it was actually in the 1990s that um, dioxin, the dioxin problem of uh, burning garbage became a, a big issue. Um, so yeah, the, for the focus of my paper, um, I don't think that they, they had any statistics about cancer back then. Um, but now, yeah, in the, that, that focus um, came uh, later in the 80, 80s and 90s. Um, and as for where I found the newspapers, I used the um, Asahi uh, database. Um, I can't remember the specific, what's the title of that one? You, it's very easy to use. Um, you, you can search with keywords, yeah, um, if you have institutional access. So that's what I used. Thank you. Maybe Alexander, you want to continue or? Yes, thank you very much. I was noting down the name. Um, and then I have another three questions for uh, Simona, please. Uh, first, what other channels besides of novels and movies do women use to make their voices be heard? Uh, second, how do you view the role of the media in dismantling the stigmatization against women? Are the voices of the women being heard and represented by the media? And then last, lastly, is there a pressure against female hibaksha from Fukushima not to give birth by the Japanese society? Could you elaborate on this, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very thought provoking and difficult questions. Um, so I have spoken a little bit about uh, the channels as, um, you know, being maybe narratives, oral narratives or women gathering to talk about these things, um, local movements of women uh, who are trying to encompass people from various backgrounds, not just women, mothers, locals, but um, people from everywhere who are interested in their cause. So uh, I would say maybe, you know, research about their own words or if it's available, just raw <laughs> voices, right? So um, uh, I, I think that would be probably like my my best advice to go straight to the source if possible, like, you know, the, the closest to the original it is obviously that there's always going to be some sort of filter, uh, you know, based on where the interview has been taken or, you know, what is the situation at the time of, um, you know, the, the narrative being recorded, but um, I would go for, for that. Um, yes, the, the, uh, the role of the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say no. I mean, I it's it's hard to say that the media is fully representing the voices of, of the women themselves. I would say that uh, the media that women use themselves is representative of what they're trying to do, but the general media, like the media for the masses, is, is quite, um, I think, biased on trying to uh, promote social order and harmony. Uh, by not speaking about um, very difficult uh, issues, right? That's just my personal um, 
opinion. I wouldn't say it's necessarily correct, but I think it's a little bit hard to find, um, you know, generic sources that would be really delving into these issues and you have to kind of know where to go to find some um, legitimate um, opinions <laughs> that are very maybe provocative sometimes. Um, yeah, is there a pressure? So this is very difficult to say, like I'm not, I'm not somebody who can say yes or no, there is, there is pressure, there isn't any pressure uh, on, um, you know, people who have uh, maybe, um, who have been exposed to, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> who have been exposed to like incidents of pollution of various uh, types, but um, I think if, if you look at what people are saying um, in their testimonials in the literature, etc., it's just it, it makes it so much harder for them to be to be a mother to be uh, accepted in the community, especially if their child is um, not healthy, right? They bear, they bear the burden of not being a good mother by just not uh, giving birth to a healthy child, uh, which is a little bit different from their fathers, I think. So um, I would not necessarily say that they're being openly discouraged, but I wouldn't say that they're being encouraged to have children uh, either. I think it is their personal choice in most cases, uh, and it's just more challenging uh, Obviously, we all can relate when you know you have, um, you know, like on the current situation as well. We have seen uh, the drop in birth rates, right? It's because the future is not clear, and people are scared of um, maybe side effects, etc., of vaccines, whatever it is. It's just you know that uncertainty. I think affects um, people choosing to or choosing not to uh, have a family. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now at two o'clock. Maybe we can push maybe a three or five minutes more. And Venus uh, Ditvaris, you have a question maybe, and if you can summarize or. Yes, hello everyone. And nice to see some familiar names in this group. So reconnecting, reuniting. Um, so my question is also to Simona and it's related to big changes that happened in environmental politics in Japan at the beginning of 1970s when the government uh, was afraid actually of the growing pressures in the society that was uh, reacting to the growing um, pollution and other environmental issues in Japan and then changed, introduced quite many laws, uh, actually making Japan one of the most uh, environmentally friendly countries or maybe with the most strictest regulation. So uh, my question to Simona would be, uh, have you tried to look into this and maybe see some of the women's role or women's movement or maybe some of the narratives that you uh, talked about uh, being uh, effective in, in this uh, success story? Uh, so maybe you could have some remarks uh, from your research. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question. And um, I was very worried when I read it. <laughs> I personally have not really delved into this, but I think women definitely contributed to some extent. Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you names and dates and you know to what extent they have managed to um, contribute. I think this is something that is a little difficult to measure, but it's definitely something that I would like to look in the future and if possible, can I can I throw it back at you? Like, could you share with us what, what you think happened? I think you would be more knowledgeable in this than I am. Uh, so thank you, thank you for your answer, of course. So <laughs> good luck with, uh, of course, looking into this. I think it's, uh, well, um, quite fascinating story. And, uh, well, there are much research done already about this, but from this uh, women's movement's perspective, uh, I do not remember anything being done in more detail, so I think it would be fascinating to to learn about this. But otherwise, it was really great panel. I, I was really enjoying all, all presentations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank so, you. if you, if you have another question, uh, please uh, use the raise hand raise function. No. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, so Nathan, 
Do you, it's a question or it's more? No, those, sorry, sorry, that? Ken, those aren't questions. They're just, uh, I, I loved the papers and I actually was doing some similar things to uh, Rebecca and Mariko lately. So I wanted to reach out and uh, express both my appreciation and uh, just say that I'd, I'd love to hear more, talk more uh, in the future. So I think it's a beautiful word from Nat and Hobson. So we can maybe close the session. So thank you very much for your attention and for your participation and uh, active contribution. And we hope really that we can see uh, together very soon in person and not only on the online format. So thank you again for the for the all the speaker and also all the the and Alexandra for all the logistical assistance and uh, and uh, have a have a very nice Saturday uh, Saturday because summer evening and here is still in the afternoon.